fantastic game room broadcast from the intergalactic space arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of this wonderful beat-em-up on the Sega Genesis called Growl, which is like Streets of Rage or Double Dragon, a game where you save the animals from countless women in miniskirts. As you kids like to say, dat music though, spelled incorrectly. It's Growl for the Sega Genesis from 1991. Look, there's water flowing from the letters. Gotta love that. This was originally released to the arcades in 1990 from Taito. Who do you think you are? Come on, stupids. This is a beautiful side-scrolling beat-em-up that's like Double Dragon with an environmental theme. It's terrible, but amazing at the same time. Yes! All the animals are safe. Tonight, we eat human! Choose a character and slaughter waves of identical bad guys as you fight for the animals. More identical bad guys! It's single player only though. The elephant is helping me! Yay! Go Babar! Kill them! These games are never any fun with friends. And besides, who needs friends when you have killer animals that join your team? Growl. Why have I never heard of this game before? How is this not regarded as one of the best Genesis games? I'm killing people with my pet elephant. Who I've named Babar. Oh, I think I died too. You murderer! It's not good, but it makes for a great video review. Get them! Get them! Run over the humans! The funny thing is, this game is actually considered rare and it's quite expensive. You're much better off just watching me play it. There's also no way that I can top the footage of an elephant running over people, so let me just explain the gameplay here. It's basically like Double Dragon or Streets of Rage, except with Indiana Jones or one of the guys from Metal Slug. I smash boxes because they're environmentally unfriendly. What's up ladies? I'm Beryl. It's not a very good looking game, it's slow and the music is terrible. But you know... What are you girls doing later? Have a grenade! Oh. oh man, that never gets old. There's just something really likable about Growl. It's hard to put a finger on it, except it isn't. Take your karate somewhere else! This is a ridiculous game, and I love it. I fight for the elephants! It's not very well! Most of the game plays exactly the same. You enter a level and you're immediately surrounded by enemies who all look like they came out of the identical jello mold. You jump, you kick, you fight until someone drops a grenade, which conveniently gets rid of most of them, but doesn't harm you. Every now and then, the animals show some gratitude and help, like this bird who's poking out that guy's eyeballs. Thanks, bird! He got me! The elephant saved my life! Yay! You gotta hand it to this one. It has a level of absurdity that elevates it to cosmic carnage status. I don't know why I just did a feature review on Musha. I should have done it on Growl. Thankfully, it's never too late. I just need to master this game, which I've already done. Yep. This has got to be one of the best video games I've ever played. Have a grenade! That's how we say I love you! In Fuck Off City. Uh oh Man, where do they find all of these identical white women? Can I hit the birds or am I saving the birds? I'm, I'm unclear. Bonus stage! 
Growl is not a very complex video game. You punch, you kick, you've got a special attack. Quick, give me the machine gun! Shoot the damn birds! There's even four characters to choose from, although I really didn't notice any difference between them. My favorite feature is definitely the girls in the miniskirts. But when is my favorite feature not the girls in the miniskirts? Oh! I am now whipping ladies in miniskirts! Normally you have to pay extra for that. They came dressed to kill. Which sounds like a Steven Seagal movie. When you tire of admiring flammable girls in miniskirts, rock out to the incredible music in Growl, which is... Well, it's interesting. It's hard to believe that the same game system which plays the Musha soundtrack also plays this. You probably won't be buying the Growl soundtrack anytime soon. But if you do, get it on cassette. Game over, but I was surrounded by girls in miniskirts. That's normally when the game begins. <laughs> Stop fighting, you're upsetting the elephants. Look at that, they're very sad. No! Don't hurt the deer! I was going to eat that later! Oh, you dick! You truly are bad guys! Whoa! No! Girls in miniskirts, again! Where do they keep coming from? It's like there's a nightclub around here somewhere. Another one of the wonderful things about Growl is just when you think the game can't get any weirder, it finds a way. It outweirds itself. Uh-oh! It's ladies' night! Everybody get down! Yes, if you can find Growl for five bucks, it's a no-brainer. But according to sellers on eBay, it's worth far more than that. Streets of Rage 2 is a much better game. I'm a human tamer. Got to admit, I had a great time playing Growl, though. I've got a giant classic game room. Shout out and thank you. Going to my man Ahmed from Springfield Gardens, New York. Once again, thank you for sending Growl. I knew this was going to make a good review, and I think it did. The birds are free! I freed nature! I know where the animals went. These assholes ate them. It's the future where bullets fly and circuits fry in heavy duty cyborg techno slaughter. It's Metalhead! To maintain public order, a powered bipedal armed robot, or Metalhead, was created. What a stupid name! That implies the rest of it is made of wood. Metalhead quickly proved its efficiency. But it makes for a catchy video game title. It's the modern warfare killer of the future, if the future was 1994 and anybody actually bought the Sega 32X. Because this game features, in its own words, incredible, 3D textured polygon graphics, searing firefights, cyber troops, hovercrafts, and head banging heavy metal music that amps you up for pure warfare. The box says 1994, but the game says 1995. It really doesn't matter because, as far as early or mid 90s console based first person shooters go, Metalhead is. It's okay. It has its metal heart in the right place, though. Destroying things with giant robots. Always a good foundation for anything. 
Yes, when you shoot them, they fill with helium and float away. Helium-tipped rounds, they're the weapon of the future. Our bomber will take care of the remaining forces. You must eliminate all mechs in your area. Ah, oh, there's so much cheesy goodness to enjoy in Metalhead. Float and explode! An enemy special force unit is heading this way in an attempt to regain control of the area. Aw, oh, snap! I'm gonna have to drop some float and explode on them. You've got to give Metalhead some credit. Stylistically, it's pretty cool, and they try a lot in this game. For an old-school console game cartridge, there's people talking on screen, delivering voice dialogue. You have four different camera perspectives to choose from. And the controls aren't even that bad. Assuming that you're playing this with the six-button Sega Genesis controller, because you need at least four buttons for this one. The game is very straightforward in that you're given missions that you must complete in a certain amount of time, you earn points for things that you destroy, and then you can spend those points on weapon upgrades for the next mission. I got the equipment. How do you want the equip? Your right arm. And knuckle. Chain gun. This is one of those games that probably would have been really awesome had you played it back in 94 or 95. Because while the Sega Genesis, even with the 32X adapter, is not exactly a 3D first-person shooter powerhouse, Metalhead is surprisingly competent. While it's a bit slow and sluggish compared to modern shooters, it's still playable once you grasp the controls, because it doesn't use dual analog sticks, you don't use a mouse and keyboard. By holding down one of the buttons on the Genesis controller, you can speed up your walking, you can also hold down another one and strafe. Kind of clumsy, but given the speed of the game, it works. We have confirmed the destruction of the generator. While Metalhead is far from a terrific game, it is one of the reasons that I like the Sega 32X add-on for the Genesis because it has cool exclusives like Metalhead. Games that seemed like they were so immediately destined to fail, yet they went down swinging. Because they, they really weren't bad, they were just outdated almost immediately. My guess is that fans of modern shooters won't enjoy Metalhead all that much, because it is a lot slower than current 3D style games. Also, you do need a Sega Genesis and working 32X adapter to play it. But for those who remember and enjoy that early, cheesy, cyberpunk style from the mid-90s, found in games like Syndicate, Crusader No Remorse, and even Mech Warrior, you may really dig Metalhead's hard-working attempt at being cool. Like the night vision, come on. I mean, that, that's a nice attempt. It just turns everything green, but from back in the day when that really would not have been all that common in games, it's an admirable, respectable stylistic effect that shows the designer's attempt at making Metalhead something special. Even if they didn't succeed completely, you have to give them an A for effort. Mission complete. Thanks to Frank in California for another excellent donation. Even though it took me about a year to get to this one, I've enjoyed it. The target is in the battlefield. Metalhead belongs in any 32X collector's collection, right next to other classics like Shadow Squadron and Cosmic Carnage. It has giant robots that shoot things, and it's on the 32X. What more do you need? Mission complete. Mercs is a 1990 arcade game released by Capcom. It's the successor to Commando, and you can play with your friends and blow up waves of enemies Commando or Ikari Warriors style. So it's surprising when you throw in the 1991 release for the Genesis only to find out it's a single player game. This game was made for two players. Come on! Actually, if I'm not mistaken, the arcade machine was three players. 
Anyway, what you see here is what you get. Mercs is an extremely affordable game for the Genesis or Mega Drive. It's a top-down shooter and plays exactly like Commando. You fire in the direction that you're running. You do not have twin-stick style Robotron controls in this game. Which means that it's really hard and you want to keep moving before the enemies shoot you. Movement is key in these kinds of games, but they're best with two players so someone can cover your back. However, the cool thing about the Sega Genesis version of this game is that you get two different modes. You have an arcade mode and an original mode. We're watching the arcade mode here, which has the same boards and gameplay from the arcade. You mow down waves of mindless enemies and then fight giant end boss machines. Pretty typical stuff for this kind of game. Instead of simple grenades, you have what they call a mega crash attack, which acts as a super bomb kind of thing, clearing off all of the enemies on screen. Extremely handy when you're about to be killed. Keep an eye out for food items that replenish your health, like legs of lamb and hamburgers, as well as some cans of spinach. Mmm. And there's even additional weapons to pick up, like a spread shot, rocket launcher, and flamethrower. Mercs isn't all bad, it has a flamethrower. Now the game's not all that great either. Sometimes you get to hop in a crappy boat or a stupid jeep and run over bad guys, but for the most part, Mercs is your basic commando style game. Point and run in the same direction that you're firing, run around in circles, and eventually just get bored and frustrated. But it has a flamethrower, so it's got that going for it. If you really enjoy games like Commando and Akari Warriors, then I would recommend Mercs. For one thing, it doesn't cost all that much. And the original mode on the Sega Genesis version is an improvement over the Genesis Arcade mode. There's all new stages, an all new threat, threatening the world. And most importantly, you can recruit additional fighters that you can switch between during combat. That's really handy. Ooh, he may have picked up an entire roast turkey on the ground there that was in a box baking in the sun for, uh, for who knows how long. So I'm not sure if it was a leg of lamb, but it was definitely meat on a bone. And uh, if, if left out in the sun for weeks on end, uh, that would certainly give you some kind of nuclear powers and regenerate your health. Yes, Burner joined my party. What's up, Foxy 16-bit lady? What's your name? Got a phone number? Because this is 1991 and I'll have to call you and physically speak to you instead of just sending you messages online and stalking your Facebook status. Check out how I switch between characters and when I was chatting with my 16-bit senorita. That's where I can cash in some medals for additional health and supplies. In the privacy of a tent in the middle of a battlefield. We don't call it a love shack in Mercs, it's a love tent. And yes, I'd like some additional health, please. Another guy named Launcher joined my party. These sound like imitation G.I. Joes. And I'm eventually going to get blown up and then play something else. Mercs is about two strokes below par. It would have been a lot better with two players because I don't find these games terribly fun in, in single player mode unless they have Robotron style controls. But that's just me. If you really like Commando or Akari Warriors on the NES or something, then you might dig Mercs. It's super easy to find, really cheap and it's got a flamethrower and love tent. Mercs! Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Cue the incredible Sega Genesis intro music because it's time for G-Lock Air Battle.
The music has a bit of a techno soft vibe to it, and the game has a lot of an afterburner vibe since it is from Yu Suzuki. Visit the U Arcade, you. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of G Lock Air Battle on the Sega Genesis, where G Lock stands for Loss of Consciousness by G Force. I think it should stand for Loss of Consciousness by Godzilla. Because if Godzilla stepped on you, you would lose consciousness. Or at least Loss of Consciousness by Gyrus. That would also be good. I hear that place is always full of sailors. So what do we have here? A game that's like Afterburner, but not quite as good. I'll just get right to the point. G-Lock is a fun game on the Genesis, but not Afterburner 2 quality. It does have some very enthusiastic dialogue, though. Uh-oh, it's like the landing sequence in Top Gun, except a thousand times easier. J just move left and right. It's hard to miss the giant aircraft carrier in front of you. G-Lock is an arcade-style flight action game where your objective is to blow up a required number of targets before the time runs out. It's just that simple. Or is it? It, it really is just that simple. You go into each mission with a certain number of missiles and bombs, and you start out by trying to machine gun as many enemies as possible so you don't waste your missiles, and then use your missiles on the tough ones later, and then bomb the ground targets. It's a fun game, but it lacks that certain something special that makes Afterburner so good. This one does have some interesting features, though. In between some levels, the camera pulls back from the cockpit view to a behind-the-plane view, which is actually way more difficult in this game. It's harder to machine gun enemies from this perspective, so save your missiles. This is the part where I use all my missiles. And uh, while this game starts off very easy, it does get difficult after a couple missions, once the enemies actually start shooting back at you. The ground attack sequences don't add much to the game at all and seem a bit out of place. G-Lock Air Battle actually reminds me of another game on the Genesis called Air Diver. There's, uh, there's actually quite a few games like this from, from this era. Can you tell that they're using a Sega Genesis D-pad to activate the Super Future map? And it's fun because in contrast to Afterburner, instead of just surviving and blowing things up for points, you have to attack enemies in G-Lock, or else you can't make it to the next level. It's like, they're like checkpoints in driving games. And obviously as you keep flying, you have to blow up more and more enemies. I like this one, but it has some stiff competition on the Genesis. Doesn't cost you much though, so you may as well head it to your collection if you like these flight action games. The music is really good, the graphics look nice. It's a relatively easy game to dive into and start playing, but difficult to master once you get to the levels where you have to start shooting down 30 enemies and you run out of missiles. As you may have noticed, you replenish your weapons in between each level with the points that you score. You don't have lives in this game, so feel free to get destroyed as many times as you want. Missiles and bullets won't hurt you, but your watch sure will. Run out of time and it's game over in G-Lock Air Battle.
Game over. Oh no, and his watch was so nice. It's the zone of danger. It's G-Lock Air Battle. Ha! I forgot about this. When's the last time you've seen a typewriter? And, and not just a typewriter, a typewriter with the things that would swing up and hit the paper. Those are super old school. And then and there was that knob where you would manually roll the paper out. I still remember the feel of that. I took typing class on typewriters. There's no way I should still be here. We need to get seven this time. Zone of danger! With loss of consciousness. As if Cosmic Carnage, Metalhead, and Shadow Squadron aren't reasons enough to own a Sega 32X, here's Knuckles Chaotix from Team Sonic, a Sega 32X exclusive, which may prompt many of you to join the 32X club. An exclusive club which has its privileges, namely bragging rights, that you have a working 32X, and are therefore cooler than someone who doesn't. <laughs> Knuckles is the star of the game. He was first seen in Sonic the Hedgehog 3. He is an echidna, which is like a spiny anteater and one of the rare mammals that lays eggs just like a platypus. It's a monotreme. And if you've ever read my comic book Wind Squid, you know about Mecha Monotremata, which is a giant robotic mammal that lays eggs of destruction. Anyway, I think that's a pretty cool choice of an animal for a character. This is a spin-off to the Sonic the Hedgehog series and one that's similar in some respects, but very different in others. For one thing, in a single-player mode at least, you're controlling what amounts to two players at once, who are essentially connected with a giant rubber band. You choose a character, and I've been playing as Knuckles, and one of the other characters will join you after you select them in a virtual claw machine and you work with the other character to pull off moves and tricks and go places that you could never do with just one character. It takes a long time to master the controls in this game, and I haven't even come close yet. Once you figure out the basics, it's actually quite easy to play, and this is probably more straightforward than some of the other Sonic games. But to really get into it, you'll have to explore some massive levels, and also kick ass in the 3D running and falling sections. Look familiar? We're going for some Chaos Rings! This is another one of these games that shows the power that the ill-fated Sega 32X adapter for the Sega Genesis actually possessed. It's a beautiful 2D side-scrolling adventure game with some fluid uh, 3D style sections like we see here. This game does things that the Sega Genesis by itself could simply not do. And for the most part, it keeps things traditional 2D, so it doesn't come across horribly dated like some of the early 3D attempts. For a 1995 release, it's aged perfectly. And while this is not my genre, I think that fans of the Sonic games and 2D side-scrollers will love this one, because it's so very clever, playable, and most importantly, fun. Knuckles Chaotix is fun. Knuckles Chaotix is a sizable game like the other Sonic Adventures, and it has a battery backup so that you can save your game. This particular copy was loaned to Classic Game Room by Joey in Vero Beach, Florida. So thank you very much. This is actually one of the last loaner games that you'll see on the show because it now takes over a year to get to them. 
So in that time, Joey, your your game cartridge has been submerged, lit on fire. The dog uh, threw up on it twice, and I spilled half a gallon of paint thinner on it. But don't sweat it. It's in mint condition. Oh, and I erased all of your save game data. I'm just kidding. In fact, I didn't even save my game because I didn't want to erase any of your save game data. Joey apparently won the game several times. So it, it's just fine, although, well, oh, damn it, it is sitting on a giant electromagnet right now. You play the game using the D-pad and three of the buttons on the Genesis controller. One button jumps, the other will hold your other character in place, and the A button calls that character if you happen to lose them somewhere, at the cost of 10 rings. Each of the characters does something different, Knuckles can climb, and I should note that you can also play this as a two-player game together, although I was not able to try that for this review. You won't find this one on the Sonic's Ultimate Collection for 360 or PS3. I think it may have a PC release. But if you've already got the Sonic games and own a Sega Genesis, Knuckles Chaotix may push you over the edge to make that 32X investment. And you can watch my 32X review. The big thing to remember with that is to get all of the cables required to play it. The power adapters aren't hard to find, it uses the same power adapter as the Model 2 Genesis. But if you're using a Model 1 Genesis in particular, the wire to connect the 32X is difficult to come by. The Knuckles Chaotix game is not that hard to find on eBay, and if you like what you see on screen, it's, it's actually even more fun to play because the control mechanics, playing as one character attached to another one, are really cool and make for a very interesting 2D side-scrolling adventure. So thanks again to Joey, and Knuckles Chaotix is yet another reason that I'd like Sega to just re-release a new Genesis that also plays 32X and Sega CD games all at once for those of us with massive collections of Sega titles. It would really cut back on the number of power adapters required. Or at least just put it on 360, PC, PS3, and Wii. Knuckles Chaotix. Welcome to Classic Game Room. Are you ready for intense battle with untold evil? If so, then you're ready for Blades of Vengeance on the Sega Genesis. Imagine Golden Axe mixed with a 2D platformer like Rastan and the EA yellow thing on the side of the cartridge. And you've got this. Also, my friend Ben did another awesome Sharpie job on the logo. Let's take a look. Blades of Vengeance! No relation to Blades of Steel. This is Blades of Vengeance on the Sega Genesis, an interesting side-scrolling platformer where you choose one of three warriors and fight your way through levels that look like this. And uh, battle enemies that look like those things and other monsters. It's kind of generic, but at the same time, Kind of likable. I've never actually heard of this game until it showed up and I started playing it and I'm like, oh, all right, you know, uh, babes in bikinis fighting lava monsters with a sword and her sandals. Like, that's that's not so bad. Sounds like a good weekend, really. It's got lava. I always like lava. And it has a hidden platform. It's a little tricky. There we go. The hidden platform is great. Uh, that way you can jump ahead levels. This game is actually really tricky. And there's a move that you uh, that, that your character has where you jump, and then at the very top of your jump, you attack. And then he or she goes a little bit higher, and that's how you reach that platform, and then you can use those doors to advance to the 
levels later in the game. So, what's this one all about? Well, pretty much what you see on screen here. It's really no more complicated. It's a tough game because your character, especially after the first level or two, is extremely underpowered compared to all of the enemies. Stock up on health potions, stock up on power-ups, you'll need them at the end of each level, is a boss battle. So there's not a whole lot of innovation here, it just takes a familiar format and uh, makes it kind of weird, like this. Stock up on health potions, stock up on force fields, stock up on power-ups, you'll need them. In between each level you can buy some additional extra lives or uh, invincibility potions or later on you can pick up some armor. Explore every level because there's hidden stuff everywhere and chests filled with money that you can use to buy these power-ups and hey somebody gives Laura Croft a run for her money. She's great at climbing ladders. Up and down. She gets it right every time. There's three characters to choose from, the babe in the sandals, the dude that looks like Conan, and the wizard, so it's kind of like Gauntlet. Why are these food badly? I'll just talk like that all day. Yeah, it's kind of like Gauntlet, but not at all. Oh look, moving platforms. The level designs are pretty generic. In fact, for the most part, the whole game is generic, but... You know, it's somewhat likable. I just like the large characters on screen, and the animation is great. I mean, just look at the detail. The colors are spectacular. After level 3, you can pick up some armor for your characters, and her armor looks awesome. Then she gets a crossbow, which sucks for close combat, though. It's better for uh, some of the later levels in the game when you want to keep your distance from enemies. Memorization comes in pretty handy, as you might expect. Look at that great thatched roof! Rarely do you see thatched roofs that good. Oh, ladder climbing again. It's the blast processing. Here's the guy who's a bit more powerful, a bit slower, as you might expect. I think the wizard can start shooting things right away, but he's, he's just, he's too weak. Barbarella is the best character in the game because, uh, she's a little faster. She gets the crossbow later on. When you get his armor, he gets this, uh, what is it, a morning star, but, it, like, it doesn't do anything. Also, his ladder climbing skills are whack. Where's the jiggle? Come on! Look at the backgrounds, they're so... They're so plain. It's like Castlevania, if Castlevania wasn't as, as good. I kinda like this one, but I'm not sure why. If you like a good hack and slash, side-scrolling, Dungeons and Dragons styled platformer, you, got, you gotta pick up Blades of Vengeance. It's cheap. It does look pretty good for the most part. The character animation is the best part of the game, I think. Especially when climbing ladders. Look, we've got a weird face that shoots saw blades, lasers, and a table saw. Don't forget to collect all of your your potions and stuff. And you can jump ahead levels, but it's actually better just to play the whole way through the game. You, once you memorize the boss battles, it's not too bad. It's just I find the levels a bit long and generic, so they get boring after a while. So I, I would say this one is recommended, but not necessarily highly recommended. It, it's okay. For a couple bucks, you can enjoy Blades of Vengeance and lots of ladder climbing on your Sega Genesis. Thanks again, Ben, from Buffalo, New York, for sending this to the show.
I always appreciate some good 16-bit ladder climbing and descending. Classic game room broadcast from the intergalactic space arcade on its never ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room. I love the bright red Sega Genesis game cartridge for Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage. This game should have a crossover with Cosmic Carnage, then it would be really good. This is true. Fortunately, the game is good anyway, and dig the intro music from none other than Green Jelly, who many of you may remember as Green Jello which at one point in the band's lineup featured Danny Carey, the drummer from Tool. This one starts off with some nice comic book style cutscenes letting you know that villain Carnage has escaped captivity and it's up to you, Spider-Man, to stop him. by beating up a bunch of thugs and supervillains in 1994's Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage from Software Creations published by Acclaim for the Genesis, one of the few really good games from Acclaim. This one is also available on the Super Nintendo. It's a very cool game because it plays like Streets of Rage with Spider-Man and Venom, and it has the word Carnage in the title. Always a good thing. Try to name a bad game with the word Carnage in the title. If you say Cosmic Carnage, you'll be struck down by lightning. I like the game, but I find it humorous that Spider-Man, one of the world's premier superheroes, can get his ass kicked by a girl flinging her hair at him. I feel like he needs to toughen up in this game. These thugs should pose no threat whatsoever to Spider-Man. Maybe he's just having an off day anyway, after you plow your way through some fairly predictable side-scrolling beat-em-up brawling levels, you fight boss battles, which can be pretty tricky. And then you can start to play the game as either Spider-Man or Venom. The game plays out differently depending on who you choose, although they both play pretty much the same. When you get down to it, this one is just a fun side-scrolling beat-em-up that makes good use of the Spider-Man license. It's a colorful game, it obviously has some terrific music, and there's hidden stuff everywhere. So Maximum Carnage gives you a lot of things to do. There's good replay value in this one. You're also being scored. But it's a pretty tough game, so you'll want to pick up the one-ups and continues laying about. Oh, Carnage, you're such a jokester. As the intro indicates, there's lots of superhero and supervillain cameos in Maximum Carnage who will occasionally come to your aid like Cloak and Dagger. I've got two people to thank for sending this game to the show. Henry from Columbia, Maryland, and Robert from Surrey, British Columbia, in Canada. So thank you, Henry and Robert. Yes, I recommend that Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo fans play Maximum Carnage. 
It's a tricky game. If you find yourself getting stuck, just search the internet for a walkthrough and find the location of all of the one-ups and continues. They'll prove handy. I should also mention that you're really going to want a six-button Sega Genesis controller for this since you'll be punching, jumping, and slinging webs. As well as web slinging. Nice bathrobe. All right. Superhero games and movies and stuff are pretty hot now, so this seems like a series that could definitely come back. Let's all hope for some more Maximum Carnage in our everyday life, as well as more Maximum Carnage video games in the future. Feel my fist! I'm your unfriendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Die! It's World War II or something, and the enemy is fresh out of airplanes, but they have a lot of tanks and a lot of boats. You, on the other hand, have no tanks or boats, but you have a lot of airplanes. Yet, the odds are still against you. It's Twin Hawk for the Sega Mega Drive from Toa Plan. This is the European version of the game, which was sent to the show by our friend Alexander in Duisburg, Germany. A giant thank you. As far as I know, Twin Hawk never received an American release on the Sega Genesis. So I'm playing this on the Retron 3, which plays Mega Drive games with ease and smashes region encoding. It's a shame it's never received an American release on the Genesis because it's a great game. A lot like Fire Shark and Truxton, but also a bit different. In Fire Shark and Truxton, you can power up your airplane or spaceship with weapons that clear the screen of enemies. In Twin Hawk, you'll always be outgunned. You only slightly increase the power of your machine guns, but you can call in a reserve fleet of airplanes to give you backup support. That's where this game is really different, and that's one of the reasons it's really cool. There's two difficulty settings, easy and hard, and easy is plenty hard, so I'm just playing on easy. Twin Hawk isn't much to look at like most of the Toa Plan games. It's got a chunky graphical style. This one's not too colorful and the music is also kind of dull, but the gameplay really kicks ass. Unlike a lot of vertical scrolling shooters, Twin Hawk throws enemies at you from every direction. And they must have some really fast tanks to catch up to your airplane because they'll constantly be attacking you from the bottom of the screen. So keep an eye out for enemy bullets because it's easy to fly into them when you're not looking. When you're destroyed, you lose your weapon power-ups, but you don't lose or change the speed of your airplane, something that always throws me off. So even though your airplane loses some of its weapon strength, it's not impossible to continue playing like some games. For one thing, it replenishes your supply of backup reserve airplanes. And notice that when I call them into play, they stick with me for as long as they're in the air. But eventually, they'll all get shot down. There are some power-ups that you can collect, extra lives, and additional reserve airplane special super weapon things. But that's about it. Twin Hawk is pretty straightforward, and that's what makes the game good. It's a solid vertical scrolling shooter with excellent replay value, and if you enjoy other Toa Plan shooters like Fire Shark and Truxton, then you'll love Twin Hawk. Notice that I rely on my backup support fleet to clear out enemies on this side. I kind of feel bad for the people flying those planes, but not really, because they're helping me survive. And that's what's important. My high score. Because in order to earn extra lives and extra planes, you have to continue playing.
Another major difference between Twin Hawk and a lot of other vertical scrolling shooters is the lack of ridiculous end boss battles. This isn't a bullet hell style shooter. It has far more in common with old school shooters like Xevious. You'll have to memorize some levels, figure out where enemies are coming from, and try to hang on to your reserve planes as long as possible without using them. I kind of use them all the time, but I'm still learning all the levels. This particular game is really shafting me on my gun power-ups, but it did give me an extra life. That's not very common. So one thing I'm frequently doing in this game is dodging just about everything because I can't blow up the bigger tanks. My guns aren't powerful enough. And you won't believe this, but eventually you start attacking battleships in a vertical scrolling airplane shooter? No way! <laughs> it's not high on originality when it comes to backgrounds, but the gameplay is really solid. Twin Hawk for the Sega Mega Drive. Thanks again to Alexander from Germany, who also sent a long biohazard battle, which I'll be covering in a different review. It's Twin Hawk from Toa Plan, based on the 1989 arcade machine. This was a 1990 release. Now, there's still hope that it could come out for the Genesis. Let's keep our fingers crossed. This game starts you off with a pretty rockin' soundtrack and a nice intro sequence where we get to see space stations and giant robots and nice shading. It seems like it's going to be a very exciting space video game with a name like Heavy Nova. But this all sets you up for a major disappointment. I'll start from the beginning. I actually bought this game because I thought it was Hard Nova. Hard Nova was a space science fiction game that came out in 1990 or 91 on the PC. I used to play this when I was a kid and really liked that game and I was thinking about it the other day that I wanted to review Hard Nova because it was like this really cool space sci-fi adventure game. I did a search for it on eBay and saw this Heavy Nova and thought that maybe I just remembered the title incorrectly wasn't aware if it came out in the Genesis or not, so I picked it up. It cost all of one dollar. Well, this wasn't the game I was thinking of, but I decided to try it anyway because it had a giant robot, and it was on the Sega Genesis, and most Sega Genesis games were really good. 
Well, this turned out to be quite possibly the worst video game I've ever played in my entire life. You're a giant robot whose sole mission is destruction and you can't even get over boulders without hurting yourself. It's hard to see on screen, but this game has the worst controls of any video game I've ever played. It kind of looks nice, it has interesting music, but it is simply unplayable. Let's look at the first boss encounter where I'm fighting one of the three heavy dolls, as they're known in this game. I'm literally punching through this thing and hitting nothing, and randomly I would either hit it or it would hit me. The only way to evade punches is to duck, which makes you completely invincible. There's no way to actually hit your opponent when they're ducking. Jumping in the air, which you jump by pushing up. It's not a button. Even though you have three Genesis buttons on the controller, you don't use the C button at all. You have a punch button, a kick button, and you jump by pushing up. But it doesn't control in any normal way at all. So fighting is basically mashing buttons and hoping for the best. Alright, see that guy? He's floating in the air and I'm punching him and kicking him, but I'm not actually hitting him. I can't think of any fighting game where you can't hit opposing characters in the air. There's no combinations, so it randomly decides when to punch or pick up your opponent and throw them. If you're kicking the enemy, he might just jump in midair, and then none of your kicks actually land on him. Getting back to the gameplay, after you defeat each end boss, it turns into a side-scrolling adventure game where you have to uh, progress your way through various levels and avoid obstacles like rocks that kill you, enemy robots, they have uh, laser beams. Graphically, the game is fairly nice, but the level design does seem somewhat uninspired. As you make your way through the levels, you run into these little robots and you have to destroy them. The easiest way to destroy these short robots would be, of course, to kick them. But you don't kick them like normal. You swing your leg out and then hit them while your leg comes back down. The movement and the jumping is ridiculously clumsy. And it's a chore just to navigate these incredibly simple levels. But it's not fun in any way, shape, or form. My doll. They call them heavy dolls. You'd think they'd call them like your cyborg killer warrior, but no. This is your doll. And it gets even worse. So when your doll is fighting the end bosses, if you look at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see where there's a, there's a meter, which is my health meter, and below that is a power bar. At least I think that's what it would be called. And you can't move at all. No matter how many buttons you mash, you can't physically move in any way, shape, or form if your power meter goes down below two bars. So when the enemy robots hit you and your power meter goes down and then it gets below two, you literally just lay there on the ground and then they randomly decide to walk around you and pick you up and smash you and throw you. You can tell that this game has almost no AI in it at all. It, it, it must have like three, three or four different commands that, that your enemies actually go through in fighting you. And they just rotate through some, some kind of cycle. And I really have tremendous respect for video game designers for the most part, but this game feels as if it was unfinished. But wait, there's more! Well done, you have passed our test with a score which nobody else has achieved before. 
Even though I just got my ass kicked and actually had to continue the game once, I've gotten a score which nobody else has ever achieved. I can only assume that's because most people upon seeing this game immediately returned it. Please prepare yourself immediately. We have no time to waste. Your first mission is to attack the floating fortress under construction, which is positioned between the Arath and the moon. There you will battle Rebel Academy graduates who have been attempting coup d'etat against us. Unfortunately, to this day, all other attempts to defeat the Rebel forces have failed. Your strength is our only hope. The future of the United World Defense Forces is in your hands. Good luck. Good job proofreading. And let's move on to mission two. Which seems like it might get promising, like there'd be more variation in the levels, but again, the clumsy, sluggish controls make this game practically unplayable. As I'm doing my rocket kicks and destroying the bad guys shooting missiles at me, I was simply playing this game at this point to see if I could find any more typos. I wish I had a guy here that could do the announcer voice. You know, like the uh, like they would do in boxing or something. Because you know, two of my punches just went right through that guy's face even though he was standing in front of me. A couple of his punches just went right through me and somehow or other I picked him up and threw him. Here's a punching switch. I like the fact that obstacles in the game come at you or come from below you so quickly because these levels are so poorly designed that even if you could react in time to stop them, it wouldn't matter because the controls are so goddamn slow. Your robot just smashes into them and starts blinking anyway. This is basically the most worthless robot ever made. I'm sorry, actually it's not a robot, it's a heavy doll. Maybe this doll needs to lose some fucking weight and then the controls wouldn't be so sluggish. Honestly, I can't imagine what they were thinking when they green-lighted this game. It's not even close to completion. If you could think of the worst video game you've ever played, think of playing that video game with controls that took about five or 10 seconds from when you pushed a button till you actually saw something happen on the screen. That's this game. And here we're at the last boss that I got to because I, quite frankly, just lost patience at this point and decided that fighting was not so much an act of skill in this game as it was sheer luck. I was really trying to figure out how to fight in this game and it made no logical sense. And it even says that your heavy doll advances levels and gets new techniques, but there's no combinations of button pushing that will get you to use those new techniques, it just does it randomly. Keep in mind when you're watching the end here that even if I wanted to get up and defend myself, I couldn't because the controls won't work if your power meter is below two bars. All that you can do is sit back on your couch, set your Genesis controller down beside you, kick your feet up on the table, and just watch the other heavy doll wail upon your heavy doll because it doesn't matter, you can't fight back anyway. This goes on for about a minute. And then finally, the best scene of the game, the game over screen. Which frankly, I'm impressed that they managed to spell that correctly. This is without a doubt the worst video game on Arath.
be Section 7. In the year 2140 AD, all intergalactic disputes must be settled by a duel to the death. All duels represent the final and binding decision between the galaxy's superpowers. You represent the Federation's greatest hope of winning the war against its enemies to regain control of intergalactic traffic lanes throughout the universe. I was out on another one of my classic video game scavenger hunts and came across this cartridge called Death Duel for the Sega Genesis. And before I could even say the words, I'd like to buy Death Duel, I had already bought Death Duel because the game cartridge has a giant robot facing off against a giant monster with laser beams and it's called Death Duel. In all fairness, I wasn't expecting much for the $2.50 that I paid for Death Duel. And after seeing the title screen, I thought this game was going to be an awful cheesy mess. But then I started playing it. Death Duel is actually a lot of fun. It looks so goofy, yet this game is highly enjoyable, requires a bit of strategy, and it's, and it's just simply entertaining. In some ways, this game is like a bad movie that you watch because it's so bad that it's good. But in other ways, this game is actually good. The bad guys look ridiculous. The backgrounds look like they belong on a 1970s custom van. And take careful note that the girl that walks out and gives her motivational speech before each death duel is wearing Daisy Dukes with a tank top where they've taken the time to carefully render her nipples. <laughs> Nothing sells better than sex and violence, and death duel has them both. With the addition of giant robots and monsters. That means that Death Duel is the quadrangle of perfection. Let's talk a bit about the gameplay. Because surprisingly, this game has good controls and plays very well. You move the targeting cursor around the screen with your gamepad and the three buttons on your Sega Genesis controller control your three weapons. At the beginning of each duel, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. At the beginning of each death duel, you're given the chance to equip your giant killer robot with various weapons. There's a number to choose from, machine guns, missiles, guided missiles, you have electroshock things that can freeze other robots and uh, the spinners, which are like grenades. For each duel that you win, you win money depending on how fast you, you win that duel and also on how many various body parts you destroy on your opponent. As a general rule, I like any game where you get extra points for blowing up your opponent's arms and legs. The game requires a good bit of strategy to continue on to the later levels because you can easily spend all your money on expensive weapons. Different enemies from the Nines require different weapons to defeat. And also varying strategies. Sometimes you want to blow their legs up first. Sometimes you aim for the head or the wings, naturally. And this guy's pretty interesting because his left arm is very powerful, but you can't destroy it first because he can put it back on with his right arm. So you actually have to blow up his right arm to prevent him from being able to re-equip his left arm after you shoot it off. The 
machine gun is the cheapest weapon, and it's one of the faster and more accurate ones that I use to blow up his legs one by one. Now he can still shoot me with something on his shoulder, so I'm trying to hit that. There's obstacles like the floating brick wall thing that get in your way, and you can explode the pilot of the robot thing with your missile. And I think it goes without saying that the music is pretty funky fresh. As you might expect, the bad guys get harder and harder as you progress in the game, and sometimes you need to buy more expensive weapons to destroy them. So cash is an issue. They give you bonus shooting gallery type rounds in between each actual death duel, where you can try and blow up a bunch of monsters on screen crawling by you, and that gets you extra cash, which is important. So you want to make sure you get good at those levels, even though they're not the most exciting part of the game. In the earlier rounds, I try to buy as few weapons as possible, or the really cheap ones like machine guns. And then for the later bad guys, I try to stock up on the more expensive weapons. As silly as Death Duel might look, the game requires practice strategy. And for your viewing pleasure, I've assembled some of my favorite motivational statements from the Death Duel cheerleader. If you happen to be defeated in Death Duel, don't worry, because you're greeted with one of the greatest endings of any video game ever made. As if losing in Death Duel and dying wasn't enough. This game rubs it in. Your defeat has brought chaos to the Federation. Your cowardice and betrayal shall be known throughout the stars. Your decaying corpse will be an object for ridicule and scorn. Disgrace will follow your family for centuries. Once adorned and worshipped by all, your rotting flesh will serve as a reminder of the price of failure. Oh, the horrible pain of defeat. Doing the gun store recording today. I wanted to make it sound like I'm cracking a 40 though. Yeah! Feel it! Feel it! Nothing else sounds like that. Can you feel the bass? 16-bit blast processing in your face! It's Gunstar Heroes. From 1993 on the Sega Genesis, why has it taken me this long to play this game? I don't 
don't know. I don't have an excuse, but it's really good. The wait was worth it. Gunstar Heroes is incredible. This is one of the very best Sega Genesis games that deserves to be spoken in the same sentence as many other Genesis heavy hitters including Musha, Truxton, The Revenge of Shinobi, and of course Herzog. Zwei Gunstar Heroes is that good. The action, the atmosphere, the music, the attention to detail is incredible. This game actually reminds me of three of my favorite games rolled into one. Contra, Troubleshooter on the Genesis, and Strider. It doesn't look much like Strider, but something about this reminds me of Strider. I am crazy after all. I think what really makes Gunstar Heroes special is the fact that it's really, really fun and kind of unique. There's nothing else quite like this. Just the way that Treasure assembled this game clearly shows signs of brilliance since they went on to do so many other phenomenal games. In fact, I believe this is their first game, which makes it even more impressive. Oh, you're wondering, what else did Treasure do? Well, let me rattle off a few games that you may have heard of, including Sin and Punishment, Radiant Silver Gun Ikaruga, Gradius V, Sylphid the Lost Planet, and McDonald's Treasure Land Adventure. Any game that features the Hamburglar in a side-scrolling spaceship shooter belongs in your collection. Is Grimace one of the bad guys, one of the end bosses? Can you blow up Grimace with lasers? That would be great. Warning, warning, McDLT ahead. Alright, so what's going on here? It doesn't look too hard. Well, I'm playing most of this game on easy because I suck at video games. Also, once I figured out the homing laser combination, which basically just gives me Hunter from Thunder Force. That opens up a world of possibilities. Namely, I don't have to aim at anything. It does the aiming for me. Homing lasers. They're the future. At least according to Ray Crisis, and who can argue with Ray Crisis? So this is kind of like Spriggan on the PC Engine. You mix and match different weapons to create new ones. There's like a standard laser shot, and then like a powerful blue laser beam, and then there's like the homing green things, but if you combine the homing green things with the super powerful blue laser, you get a homing blue laser, which admittedly just kind of resembles a giant blue neon pipe cleaner for most of the game, but it does a lot of damage, though occasionally you do have to coerce it to hit the thing that you want it to hit. Like stop hitting the end boss's foot and actually hit his eyeball for once. You can also get flamethrower combinations. Basically, you can just do all kinds of fun stuff in this game. And you can also play it with a friend, two-player, simultaneously. It's like Cheeky Cheeky Boys on the Genesis, but way better. And Cheeky Cheeky Boys wasn't that bad. So, so it's like Troubleshooter on the Genesis, but with less knee pads and short shorts. I'm playing with my son here, and we stepped up the difficulty to normal, which is far more challenging than easy, especially during the multi-tiered boss battles. Most of the boss battles go through several stages, and they're, they're pretty tricky. If you're looking for a tough game on the Genesis, this delivers. I think the graphics look nice. I like the art design in this game, and of course the music is spectacular. This has one of those rich, really well-produced Sega Genesis soundtracks, worthy of owning on vinyl, which I do own it on vinyl. It's, it's, it's good. 
There's also a jukebox mode so that you can play the music without the copious amounts of explosions and sound effects present during the gameplay. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Add Gunstar Heroes to your collection today. It's not inexpensive, but I think you'll find that it's worth it. This is among the best Genesis action games by far. It's a lot of fun, it's approachable, but also difficult at the same time depending on what difficulty level you play it at. It's a great two-player game, and it sounds cool too. Gunstar Heroes. It's just, it's a good title. And it's a good game. It's Merg. You remember that one? Anyone? Anyone? From 2085? Merg? Mark enjoys! Recommended game. Rocket Knight Adventures from Konami for the Sega Genesis. This was released in 1993 and is regarded by many as the greatest 2D side-scrolling adventure game on the Genesis. I'm not sure if it's the best, but I can see why people would think that. The level design in particular is absolutely superb. You're playing as an opossum with a rocket jetpack, and much of the game actually reminds me of the classic Sonic the Hedgehog games. The gameplay is not exactly the same, but something about the attention to detail and production value puts Rocket Knight Adventures right up there with the big Sonic titles. Rocket Knight Adventures is like a good song, a good piece of music. It doesn't stay the same the whole way through the game. It changes pace, it changes style. Constantly. Some, something you did not see in many 2D side-scrollers back in the day. They usually picked one style and stuck with it. And as you're on this adventure, you'll go through a wild variety of different levels, fighting a variety of different enemies. The music in the game is very cool and matches what's on, what's on screen well, and it's also changing constantly. It's a fairly sizable game with eight levels and you'll need to play it multiple times to make your way through it, but that's cool because it doesn't get old. There's lots of things to find, like one-ups hiding up in the corners that you can jump up and get. You're being scored for points, there's multiple difficulty settings, and to top it all off, the game isn't even that expensive or difficult to find for your Sega Genesis. As I'm recording this in early 2010, there's news that Konami is even remaking it. You can see why. It's awesome. Did you catch that? This game is so clever. He went from the foreground to the background behind the waterfall. Something so simple, but it's just done so well in Rocket Knight Adventures. And you see things like that the whole way through the game. The lava reflection part being my favorite. You'll see that coming up. That was close, I almost lost a life there, but uh, I picked up some bananas, and as with other games like Ms. Pac-Man and Super Monkey Ball, bananas are the most powerful fruit. This game was donated to Classic Game Room by Sean. The review has taken a while to get posted, but thank you very much, Sean. For whatever reason, I did not play this one back in the 90s. Probably because I was still busy playing Herzog's Y. Ah, jumping timing scenes. I'm always terrible at those. I think I lost three lives on that one simple part. 
I actually don't play very many 2D side-scrolling adventure games, but this one is right up there with the best of the best. Games like Sonic the Hedgehog, Strider, Bionic Commando, and The Revenge of Shinobi. My personal favorite on the Sega Genesis. Now that I'm thinking of it, in a way this game feels a bit more like some like a game like Yoshi's Island on the Super Nintendo. Like check this part out. You're playing by watching your reflection in the lava to see the hidden platforms behind the crystals. It looks like a Genesis game, but it feels like a Super Nintendo game from Nintendo. This is by Konami. But it's just got so much emphasis on style, and it backs it up with gameplay. Now one of the big things in this game that you probably have noticed by now is that you're not just jumping and attacking, but you also have to charge up your jetpack, which allows you to jump higher, and it also acts as an attack, as you see during this boss battle. So uh, I guess I've lavished Rocket Knight Adventures with nothing but praise, but if there's anything wrong with this game, I can't find it. I have to recommend this one for fans of 2D side-scrollers. Whether or not you find a copy for the Sega Genesis or keep an eye out for Konami's re-release, they typically do good work with their remakes. And if they're bringing this one back, that's one I can't wait to see. It's like Donkey Kong on top of a blimp. Good times to be had in Rocket Knight Adventures. Highly recommended, and thanks again to Sean. If you missed this game the first time around, it's not too hard to find again, so check it out. Play a badass opossum with a jetpack. Vector Man 2 was released in 1996 for the Sega Genesis, which technically makes this one of the last Sega Genesis games. And you can see Vector Man rocking out in celebration. When this game was released, the PlayStation and Sega Saturn were on the market. Technically, this is one of the strongest offerings on the mighty 16-bit Sega Genesis. Vector Man is a remarkable accomplishment. Harnessing the power of blast processing to bring you visuals that look like this. Wow. The question is, does the rest of the game live up to its technical prowess and stunning graphics and art design? Now, I'm a huge fan of the original Vector Man. I think it's remarkable, and m maybe it's just me, but I feel like the developers got right to the end of this game and uh, cut it off short since this was released at the tail end of the Genesis life cycle. It's so close to being great, but not quite there. The level designs are awkward and unbalanced, and that's something that really impacts your adventure through the game. For example, the forest levels are way too dark considering how well they've done the rest of the visuals in the game. And level 3, I think, in particular, is enormous, followed up by levels that'll take you 35 seconds later in the game. Also, there's this neat feature in Vector Man 2 where he can sort of absorb other enemy attacks, like Kirby. So you get this great rhino power later in the game, but it only lasts for about 15 seconds, so you can't do much with it. The developers are teasing me. Yeah. 
And later in the game, you can play as a tank. Vector Man as a tank. Look how excited he is. But keep in mind, this was following on the heels of Vector Man, one of the most ambitious Sega Genesis releases and a great game. I like Vector Man too. I recommend it. Just don't expect it to be as good as the original. At least that's my opinion. It's fun to see what the developers were able to pull out of the Genesis so late in its life. Some of the levels are downright remarkable, and I love that one end boss that looks like you're trying to tune an old fashioned television. The music is fun and the gameplay is very similar to the original Vector Man. Some of the levels also provide ample opportunities for exploration and collection of all the orbs and additional life containers. Vector Man 2 won't cost you very much, it's actually a pretty affordable game and you can even find this one on many of the Sega Genesis collections like Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection. This is one of these series and a character that I'm sad to see vanish into obscurity because Vector Man clearly has a lot of potential here. For those of you looking for more challenge, Vector Man 2 is harder than the original. There's numerous scenes where you jump blindly and end up landing on numerous enemies waiting to kill you. Level memorization helps for sure. And I'm playing this on the original Sega Genesis using SCART cables from my friend Rob at RetroGamingCables.co.uk. Bringing out every bit of detail in Vector Man 2. It's a beautiful game. And don't forget to turn up the volume because it rocks. As far as I know, this was the last of the Vector Man releases. Vector Man's Swan Song. A good game. With more potential, maybe he'll return sometime in the future on the Sega 32X. This one is recommended for those of you who are big Genesis and Mega Drive fans like me. It's a fun, quirky platformer filled with replay value and some levels worthy of exploration. Keep an eye out for those point multipliers, by the way. If you can get the 10 time multiplier and kill a whole bunch of stuff, you get a lot of extra vector men. Vector Man. Perhaps the sequel should be on a vector-based game console. The Vectrex, perhaps? Hunt this one down, and don't forget to play the original first to get the full progression of the Vector Man experience. The independent military nation Zeus has been established in the colony Olympus on Saturn's ring. Zeus equipped its symbolic machine Guzan Giao and other armies with a living fighting computer geosystem. They then started to attack the Earth's United Nations on the planet Jupiter. Initially, the Earth's United Nations put all its power to fight and defense, but was defeated by the powerful geosystem. To stop the invasion, the Earth's United Nations equipped its variable fighter Baryon with its own geosystem and fought back.
The only thing better than flying a spaceship against impossible odds is flying a spaceship against impossible odds that transforms into a giant robot. And that's what this game is all about. This is Android Assault. So I guess in, in theory you transform into a giant android, which is technically different than a robot. However, if you read the if you read the back of the packaging, it says it's a living robot, and that would actually make it a cyborg. Rather than arguing over terminology, I think we can all agree that it's cool. just hovers around in that same pose but that's all right because this game basically mixes giant fighting ninja robots with a musical score from white snake later in the game we get barry arm to roll around the front of a jaguar just like tawny katane I found out about this game from our friends over at the Sega16.com website. And if you're a fan of the Sega Genesis, you owe it to yourself to visit their site because they have everything about the Sega Genesis imaginable there in one spot at Sega-16.com. So I was looking for some cool games a little while back, and I came across uh, an article on this game, and I said, that looks fun, and went to eBay, picked it up for a few bucks. I like these side-scrolling, horizontal, spaceship-shooting games. And this game does not disappoint. It's got robots, it's got missiles, it's got things that explode. And the musical score sounds like it came from the 1991 episode of Headbangers Ball. So this is pretty much a winning winning game as far as I'm concerned. I like these kind of games. I like the horizontal spaceship shooting games with wave after wave of mindless enemy. I mean, nothing gets you pumped up to destroy aliens like some serious hardcore guitar riffs. Your spaceship slash android has a variety of weapons to choose from. My favorite, as you'll notice in the footage, is the one that essentially is a bunch of heat-seeking missiles that go out and shoot enemies without you having to aim at them. Of course, it's the least powerful. You also have laser beams. Uh, There's one weapon that's a bunch of missiles that shoot out in front of you. I never use them because they suck. And then you have your standard shot, which is like a shotgun that goes out in front of you and also behind you. There's not a whole lot groundbreaking in this game. My favorite part is that when you do transform into Barry Arm, that he just kind of hangs out there in that one position with his knee out in front of him and flies around. So he's not, uh, he's not very animated, you might say. But maybe that's part of his charm. He's like the Stig in Top Gear. This game came out on the Sega CD in the early to uh, mid-90s there. And the Sega CD was a short-lived system. Had some unique packaging. I like the foam insert they give you to protect your Android Assault. Good luck. Power up. Power up. If anybody else thinks that this game may have been influenced by Robotech and the Zentradi Battle Fleet, Raise your hand. Power up. 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if you're going to be inspired, you may as well be inspired by Robotech. I'm not sure who first came out with the transformable robot. I'm pretty sure it was the Japanese in one form or another. First robot cartoon I remember is Transor Z. And if you haven't seen Transor Z, Google it because you need to see some Transor Z. It's awesome. And of course, I remember watching, and I still love Robotech and Transformers. And uh, right around that time, of course, we had GoBots. Can't forget about GoBots with Leader One and Psykill. all the little soldiers running towards me that I simply incinerate without blinking an eye. Without blinking an android eye, of course. You are taking your last breath. Prepare to die. You'll notice when I'm not shooting, I have my finger off of the uh, shooting button. And what that does is it charges your primary weapon. You see the bar at the top it says charge. And then when you let go, it unleashes your fully charged weapon, which varies depending on what weapon you're using. If we read the back of the packaging, it gives you some more insight into the story. Launched by the alien planet Zeus, any planet's cool if it starts with a Z or an X, of course, an armada of androids has crushed the Earth's conventional space fleet, desperate and defeated the United Nations of Earth, like that'll ever happen, has no choice but to counterattack with its own living fighting machine, Barry Arm. Perhaps that could be pronounced Barry Arm. And there's a nice photograph that says, Duck, or you'll just be another shrimp on the Barbie. <laughs> The weapon that I'm using throughout the game primarily is called the Thundercracker, by the way. In fact, wasn't there a Transformer named Thundercracker? One of the original jets with Starscream? I think there was. Yeah, so back to my initial thought there. I'm not sure who came up with transformable robots, but we should really have a national holiday to celebrate them. Because they're very space-saving, if you think about it, and I would expect that to come from the Japanese, who have a much smaller country than we do over here in the United States, and they, they like very compact, neatly organized things. One would say they make the most efficient use of their space possible. So obviously, if you want to have a giant, destructive robot, you may as well also have it be your automobile or your jet fighter as well. Hence the practicality of a transforming robot. So not only can you take your jet fighter to the grocery store, but you can also transform and crush the grocery store with your foot. Now, in general, this game is nothing really groundbreaking in the horizontal space shooting genre. It has four levels of gameplay, easy, normal, hard, and I think the other one is called Mania. Good luck. Power up. What makes this game great is that it's fun. The music is fun, the gameplay is fun, the style is fun. And it's a lot like Musha for the Sega Genesis, in that you play it over and over again, each level has a different rockin' soundtrack, and it generally doesn't get boring. 
I'm not the expert on the Sega CD game system. I got mine a few years ago, so I did not have this game when it first came out. But the music in this game takes full advantage of the crystal clear CD quality sound. And actually, I think a lot more care has been put into the music in this game than a lot of newer games. definitely falls into the category of a game that would be awesome if played on Guitar Hero. This is 688 Attack Sub for the Sega Genesis from 1991, and the first thing that comes to mind is that you need to replace the refrain in 99 Luft Balloons with 688 Attack Subs, and sing that along with the game, because it's a bit short on music. We've been hitting damage, sir! Lost sonar contact, sir. Damn it! I need some music to motivate the crew. Everybody sing our national anthem! What? No, nobody, know, nobody knows it. Well, how about we just pump some music through the speakers? Look how happy everyone is. It's like they're dancing with the pause button on. We're out for blood! Engage the millipede drive! Shoot the spiders! Watch out for the mushrooms! Here's an interesting game for the Genesis. A real-time military simulator. As this was released in 91, it's like the end of the Cold War, and the movie The Hunt for Red October it was still relatively new, and, and everybody was all into submarines, and confused about why James Bond was commanding a Russian one. And if you don't play this game while quoting The Hunt for Red October, then you, you're just not playing this game. You play as Commander Marco Chuck E. Chizanovich and are at the helm of the Los Angeles, a powerful 688 SSN nuclear attack sub, and you're out to destroy secret Soviet Typhoon class missile subs. And, uh, well, as I play this game, you're out to destroy pretty much anything that floats. And if I could, I'd shoot down helicopters, but it won't let me. After you successfully complete a mission, which I just did here and sunk a bunch of tankers or something, you're then sent to San Francisco to get drunk with your crew, and are forced to listen to some of the worst music in any Sega Genesis game. Oh, what kind of reward is this? Send us back! So, not only is the crew now hungover, but everybody's eardrums have been destroyed. Back into action! You receive your orders, and then carry them out. It's pretty straightforward, and if you're going into this game expecting an action game, you'll be disappointed. It is a real-time strategy simulator with some action elements. It's actually pretty good. Once you get the hang of the controls, the instruction manual is about the size of the hardcover version of The Hunt for Red October, and just as detailed, fortunately the first mission is like a tutorial and does help you get up to speed quickly. In this particular mission, what I'm supposed to be doing is escorting these these uh, merchant vessels somewhere. Uh, but you know what? It'd be more fun just to sink them. It'd be like a little surprise for the crew. It's not the most exciting game to show you, so I'm trying to make it fun here. You've got the overall uh, main cabin view. And from that viewpoint, you select your radio, sonar, driving controls, map, and weapons, as well as the periscope. And you uh, control the submarine and the crew, much like a point-and-click PC game. In fact, this plays a lot like an old-school PC game. Much of the action will have to take place in your imagination, but it is rewarding to see vessels explode in front of you through the periscope. Especially when they're your own. <laughs> I'm gonna fire a few more torpedoes at these boats just to make sure they go down. Select target. Target acquired. Torpedo launched, Captain. 
I really dig the voice dialogue in this game, and it really does actually enhance the gameplay. 688 Attack Sub is not a game for those of you with no patience, because it takes a while for things to happen, even when you fire torpedoes. You don't get an instantly gratifying explosion followed by screams, you've got to wait for the explosion and make the screams yourself. As I'm waiting for the explosion, I'll talk about the game a bit more. When you play the missions for real, they're challenging because you've got to play like you're a real submarine commander. You try to run silent, you mark your targets, blow them up with precision, and avoid the enemies. There's actually quite a bit of tactics and strategy in 688. Attack sub, which is good because it's a bit short on action and excitement. Yeah! Oh no, we're sinking! And the other one is struck as well. We just hit a friendly, sir. Yeah, but I don't think they're friendly anymore. Oh no, our cargo of Betamax players is at the bottom of the sea. Heading into Periscope depth, sir. Here's another mission. This is actually a very interesting and well-made Genesis game. Certainly very different from Sonic the Hedgehog and most of the other action titles you might think of when you think of the Genesis. This was donated by Christopher in Salem, Oregon. So a giant thank you to Christopher. You've helped me sink many vessels and destroy many fictional lives in this game. So I think what I'm going to do after this mission is, uh, I don't know, maybe defect, steal the sub, sell it on eBay buy some pinball machines, and retire. Assuming the cook doesn't get me first. Most things in here don't react well to mullets. Raiden Tread, published by Micronet. What? Aren't those the same people who published Heavy Nova? I'm, I'm assuming they're people. Maybe the company is created by heavy dolls, run by machines. In any event, those machines should be congratulated for publishing this game, Raiden Trad, because it's Raiden, and it's on the Sega Genesis. I don't know that this particular Raiden stands out from any of the other Raiden games, but it's fun and, if you watched my packaging review, it'll get you in the mood for some 1991 dance parties. You know what goes really well with neon blue, neon green, and neon pink. So let's get to the game before I start reciting lines from 1991 rap songs about how my flying is cold as what happens to a cup of water left overnight outside in freezing temperatures. This game gets extra credit for cows on the ground. Do you see those? Are those, are those alien cows? Let's read the packaging and learn more about this. Raiden Trad. Continuously dominating number one popularity long after debut at arcades. Okay. Number of stages, 8, plus exciting additional special stage. The year is AD 2090. The world is attacked by aliens from outer space. <laughs> At least they're not aliens from within. The world has united forces which fight back fiercely. Top world scientists have analyzed wreckage of enemy planes shot down and created a supersonic fighter bomb called Raiden. However, since these aircrafts are so technically sophisticated, there is only one pilot in the entire world who is able to handle it. Me. So apparently nobody else can play this game. So, sorry, I was going to recommend this game for spaceship shooter fans on the Sega Genesis, but apparently it was made for me. Maybe that just means only one person at a time can be playing it. It sniffs itself out over the internet to which it's not connected, but it uses alien powers to detect other people playing at the same time? Question mark? Maybe? The Raiden is just about to take off, and the entire world is now depending on this Raiden. Made in Japan. N no.
So, what else can I say about this game that I haven't said in other Raiden games? Well, this one on the Genesis is a one-player game. You have two choices of weapons, the red spread shot and the blue super power laser. It's a terrific game. I, I happen to like the Raiden series. And while this is not as stylish and polished as the newer Raiden 3 or Raiden 4, it's still Raiden, and it's on the Sega Genesis. It's a fairly sizable game, one that has three different difficulty settings. I'm actually just starting to get into it. The music is nothing terribly exciting, and it doesn't have, doesn't have the stylish awesomeness that competing Musha and Truxton have on the Genesis. Raiden Trad is just a good, solid, predictable, well-made shooter with nothing fancy. It's like a pair of work boots that flies around and shoots aliens. Rugged, sturdy, comfortable, familiar, and you can still wear them out to dinner. There are three difficulty settings, and the game looks easier than it is here when the weapons are fully powered up. But you, you know how these are. One mistake, you get your spaceship blown up, and you lose all of your weapon upgrades, and then it becomes really challenging, especially in the later levels. Fans of the series may not even be aware that there was a Raiden game on the Genesis. Well, there is, because we're, we're watching it here. As an added bonus, it is super duper cheap. If you enjoy any of the other Raidens or the arcade games and like the Sega Genesis, then it's kind of a no-brainer. For less than five bucks, you can be kicking alien ass and enjoying a whopping 8 megabit memory as advertised on the front of the packaging. After all, this is the continuously dominating number one popularity long after debut at arcades game. It's Raiden Trad. And yes, it could be more colorful, maybe a bit flashier, but whatever. It's Raiden, it's on the Genesis. And that makes it a must-have for spaceship shooter fans who have a Genesis, who have good taste in games, and who want to see a glowing pink, green, and blue neon package on their shelf, proudly proclaiming continuously dominating number one popularity long after debut at arcades! Exclamation point. <laughs> 